In this example, we are giving a loop transfer function s plus 2 over s squared minus 1, all multiplied by a control gain k. The question is, what is the range of k that will make this system closed loop stable? A similar question was on last year's final examination. To start, you can again evaluate this function as a function of omega to split the real and imaginary parts. We can evaluate L of omega by replacing S with J omega. We have K times J omega plus 2 divided by J omega squared is negative omega squared minus 1. In this case, you don't need to multiply this by the complex conjugate because we don't have any complex parts in the denominator. We can simply write the function as k times the real part, that is 2 over negative omega squared minus 1, plus j times k omega divided by negative omega squared minus 1. The real and the imaginary part are clearly shown now. For this example, another good news is that we don't have any poles at the origin, which means that you only need to evaluate two points in the Nyquist contour, the point where the frequency tends to zero and the point where the frequency tends to infinity. And then, of course, find the real and imaginary axis crossing. Let's just start by evaluating the phase and magnitude of L of S when the frequency tends to zero and infinity. To do that, we can draw again the imaginary and the real axis. And now place all poles and zeros. We have a zero at negative two. And we have two poles, one at negative one and one at plus one. S squared minus one equals to zero, S equals to plus minus one. We see here we have an unstable pole. So this function in an open loop control scheme would be unstable. Let's see how it behaves in the closed loop control scheme based on the Nyquist plot. The pole and the two zeros are here. We can now place the point of interest on the imaginary axis. Let's place this point here. And this point will go to zero and then go to infinity. We can now trace all the reference lines from poles and zeros to that point. And you can now start by sending this point to zero. So here we have theta one. Let's call this one theta two. And let's call this one theta 3. When omega tends to 0, this point goes to 0. Right? We are on the axis of frequencies, so if omega tends to 0, that point goes to 0. What happens to theta 1? When omega tends to 0 and this point comes here, theta 1 is 180 degrees. Theta 2 is equal to theta 3 and they are 0. What is the magnitude of the transfer function at that point? The magnitude of L when omega tends to 0 is this goes to 0 and this one goes to negative 2k. But we are talking about the magnitude, so it's simply 2k. The magnitude is always positive. The negative sign will come from the angle 180 degrees, so everything is in agreement. If you know the angle, you can simply say 2k. What is the actual phase of the transfer function? What it did here, we just calculated individual angles. But the actual phase of the transfer function will be the sum of angle of all zeros, that is theta 3, which in this case is 0, minus the sum of angle of all poles which is 0 for theta 2 and 180 degrees for theta 1. So the phase is negative 180 degrees. Now we can move to the point where the frequency tends to infinity. We can use the same graph that we had here, but now we will take this point and send that to infinity. We are dealing with frequencies, and the imaginary axis represents the frequency axis. So now when the frequency tends to infinity, this point goes to infinity. If this point goes to infinity, what is theta 1? Theta 1 tends to 90 degrees. What is theta 2? 
theta 2 also tends to 90 degrees, and theta 3 also tends to 90 degrees. So all these angles will tend to 90 degrees. What is now the magnitude of the transfer function? When the frequency tends to infinity, the real part is zero, and the imaginary part is also zero. All right, so here we have 2 divided by infinity, that's zero. Here we have infinity divided by infinity squared, that is zero as well. The phase is again the sum of angle of all zeros minus the sum of angle of all poles. For zeros, you have theta 3, that is 90 degrees, minus the sum of angle of all poles, theta 1 and theta 2, both 90 degrees, 90 plus 90. This will be negative 90 degrees. So here you have the two points of interest. I'm going to summarize them here, and then you can draw the Nyquist plot. So for point 1, the frequency tends to zero. We have a magnitude of the transfer function at 2k, and we have phase of negative 180 degrees. For point 2, we have a frequency tending to infinity. The magnitude of the transfer function tends to zero, and the phase tends to negative 90 degrees. So I'm going to erase this. You can now draw the Nyquist plot. Now we can finally draw the Nyquist plot. One step that we didn't consider here was the imaginary and the real axis crossing. Of course, we need to do that, but here we can clearly see that it will fall into these two points again, so there is no point in calculating them. If you want to find the real axis crossing, we have to set the imaginary part to zero. The only thing that makes the imaginary part zero is omega zero, which was calculated here, and omega infinity, which was calculated here. So clearly, the real axis crossing is here, is at 2k and 180 degrees. If you now want to find the imaginary axis crossing, we need to set the real part to zero. The only value of omega that it makes the real part tend to zero is omega tending to infinity, which was found here already. So there is no additional information from this analysis. But this is a step that we should always take. Very well, let's start with point one. Frequency tends to zero. We are at 2k in magnitude, so we are at 2k at a distance from the origin at an angle of a neg negative 180 degrees. Clearly, here, this is point 1. We see the angle of negative 180 degrees, and the distance is 2k, the distance from the center of the plane. And we also have point 2. In point 2, we have a frequency tending to infinity. The magnitude of the transfer function is zero. So we are here. And we go to zero following a negative 90 degree asymptote. We determine that the imaginary axis crossing falls here. So this is the only point where we are going to cross the imaginary axis. There is no other point. The, to cross the imaginary axis, again, the real part must be zero. This only happens when omega tends to infinity, which is this case here. So this also corresponds to the only point on the Nyquist plot where we can possibly cross the imaginary axis. And this is basically all the information we have. We have to go to, the, to this zero point here following a negative 90 degrees. So we need to go up like that. We start at 2k 180 degrees, and you need to now go to this point following a 100, following a negative 90 degree angle. We know that the Nyquist plot is symmetric with respect to the real axis. We can now close it like that. And this is the Nyquist plot. Very simple. We can now evaluate the stability of our system. We have the critical point of negative one right there. What values of k will now make this system stable or unstable? Do we have any unstable poles? Yes, we have one unstable pole. So p in this case is one. This is the pole at positive one. If you don't circle negative one, now the number of unstable poles of the closed loop transfer function is p plus n. If you don't circle negative one, n is zero. We have z equals to one. 
we have one unstable pole. So in order for to stabilize the system, we now need to encircle negative one in the counterclockwise direction. That's good news because if you now make this, this Nyquist plot somehow encircle negative one, it will do so in the counterclockwise direction and n now becomes negative one. How do we make this Nyquist plot in circle negative one. We want this point to be to the left of negative one. So if you do 2k equals to negative one, or the magnitude equals to one, right? 2k, the magnitude of this point needs to be greater than one. k is 0 0.5. If now k is greater than 0 0.5, we see that at this point will be to the left of negative one. The Nyquist plot will encircle negative one in the counterclockwise direction. And if this condition is met, then n is negative one, p equals to one, negative one plus one zero, and the system becomes closed loop is stable. Now from the Nyquist plot, you can clearly see that if k is greater than zero, but is smaller than 0 0.5, the system is unstable. And if k is greater than 0 0.5, then the system is closed loop stable. There are many ways to verify this. We could look at the root locus, for example, and you'll see in the root locus, we should see a similar behavior. Let's do that just to confirm our results. If you draw the root locus for this example, we have a pole at one, a pole at negative one, and a zero at two, negative two. How is the root locus for this system? We have one more pole than zero. One of these poles, we have to go to infinity following a 180 degree asymptote. So clearly these two poles will come together. They will break away. They will move to this side. One goes to the zero, one goes to negative infinity. And here we have the same behavior that we observed in the Nyquist plot. For low values of k, the system is unstable because this pole is still unstable. Past the given value of k, now we cross into the stable region and the system becomes stable. What is that value? We can use the Ralph Hurwitz stability criterion to find that. If you put this function in a closed loop system, we can now find the closed loop transfer function by eliminating this feedback loop. And the characteristic equation of that closed loop transfer function, as we know by now, is one plus k times s plus two over s squared plus minus one equals to zero. We can rearrange this as s squared minus one plus ks plus 2k equals to zero. And now find the coefficients of s squared, which is one. Coefficient of s is k and the coefficient of s to the power of zero is 2k minus one equals to zero. With this, we can complete the routh hurwitz array s squared, s to the power of 1, s to the power of 0. Coefficient of s2 is 1. Coefficient of s is k. Coefficient of s to the power of 0, 2k minus 1. And this value here is 0. You can now find the appropriate multiplication here. 1 times 0, 0. Minus 2k minus 1 divided by negative k. And this value to the right is zero. Now, in order to find the points where the poles lie on the imaginary axis, we need an entire row of zero. So one option is k equals to zero. The other option is this entire term here equals to zero. So negative 2k minus 1 over negative k equals to zero. This results in 2k minus 1 equals to 0, 2k equals to 1, k equals to 0 0.5. Aha! The same thing we found using the Nyquist plot. When k equals to or lower than 0 
we are on the unstable region, the system is closed loop unstable. And for k equals to 0 0.5, the poles lie here on the imaginary axis. In the Nyquist plot, that would correspond to touching negative 1. So that a circle that he had in the Nyquist plot will cross the imaginary axis, would cross the real axis exactly at negative 1. And for k greater than 0 0.5, now we are in the unstable region with the poles here and in the Nyquist plot. The Nyquist plot encircles negative 1 in the counterclockwise direction and the closed loop system becomes stable.